Um, our next session will be moderated by the deputy editor of MIT Technology Review, Brian Bergstein, who will examine the connected city and how our urban centers are being forced to transform themselves. Brian. Good morning. So we're going to spend some time now talking about the problems and uh, opportunities that face big cities. So it's amazing, actually, that as recently as 1990, fewer than 40% of the world's population lived in cities. And now it's more than half. By 2050, the proportion is expected to be around 75%. After all, cities are where the opportunities are. This is what's drawing people for many of the reasons, actually, that we just, we just heard about. But cities will need innovative technologies if they're going to address all the challenges that six and a half billion urban dwellers will present. These are problems related to food, water, energy, housing, transportation. So we're watching this closely at MIT Technology Review. And this morning, I've invited some creative people on stage to talk about solutions to these urban challenges and some of the issues that they will present. Two of them will make presentations to our group here, and then two others will join us on stage for a roundtable discussion at the end. So let's begin with some thoughts from Dr. Catherine Fraze, who's Vice President and Chief Technology Officer with IBM's public sector. She's going to share some of the insights that she's gleaned from IBM's much discussed Smarter Cities efforts. Great, so thank you. I am delighted to be here. So the way this is kind of going to work, I'm going to start with some stories about things that are actively deployed now in the real world. So I'm sort of the practical end of the spectrum. And then we're going to go more and more towards, well, what could happen next uh, as we go across the session? So we talk a lot about cities. We often talk about cities in, in fora like this. We talk about them in terms of sensors and actuators and data and analytics. And all of that is true. Right? Cities are made up of a lot of built infrastructure. They have water and traffic. You know, I challenge you to find any city in the world that doesn't think it has a worse traffic problem than anybody else. Uh, and we can have a little debate over coffee about which our personal favorites are for worse traffic. I vote for Nairobi, but you know, we can have that discussion. So they have to provide things for their citizens based on their built infrastructure. They also have to provide other kinds of services that are not infrastructure-based, but are human-based. What we sometimes leave out of the discussion is the humans. And so what I want to show you in these couple of examples is how do we use sensors, actuators, data, analytics, IT, to actually change how humans behave. Because at the end of the day, the humans in the city are the source of the demand and often the source of the answer whether that's an employee of the city or actually citizens themselves. So how can we help the people to be more effective, not just more efficient? So I'm going to tell a couple of stories. We'll start with Rio. So the story in Rio begins several years ago now. They had an unpredicted, horrible, horrible rainstorm, massive mudslides, massive loss of life. The reality in Rio is not, the, the question is not, will it flood when it rains? It will flood when it rains. The only question is, how bad will it be and what could I do about it? The mayor of Rio, after this tragedy, said, I, I felt so helpless. I, I didn't know it was coming. I didn't know what to do. I never want to be that helpless again. He said, all I knew how to do was because he had grown up in Connecticut. In Connecticut, when it snows, the first thing you do is tell everybody just stay home. And so that was the only thing he knew to say to the, to the citizens of Rio. So the project in Rio, and you'll see a couple of pictures here that I'll describe in a second. Um, we started with how do you do a better job of instrumenting the weather prediction piece of the problem. So problem one was he didn't know the storm was coming. Okay. That's fixable with technology. Problem two is, all right, now I know the storm is coming. What should I do about it? And so the two pictures that you see, the top picture is a command center that the mayor built 
so that all of his agencies sit in the same place, or representatives of them, sit in the same place and can see all the information simultaneously so that they actually can have a conversation about what to do next. The picture on the bottom is um, some very, uh, I guess I'd say I'm proud of, uh, data and analytics work from IBM. And the color code that you see is actually predicting the level of flooding on every road in Rio to a couple of centimeters uh, accuracy. 24 to 36 hours ahead of the storm actually arriving. And so we run this calculation, our research division actually does it, we run this calculation before every storm and then update it as the storm gets closer. But it enables, and you'll see on the, I hope you can see it, it is not so simple as to say the deepest water will be at the bottom of the hill because it depends on topology and what's built and what's green space and where are the storm sewers and various things. And it now enables the mayor to at least say, don't plan on sending fire trucks or ambulances by your normal route, it will be underwater. Public safety, you should go to the alternate route. And we're starting to work now on how could you do something with storm drains or other things to actually ameliorate the predicted flooding. Second example I want to take is one from Dubuque. Uh, we talked just a moment ago about innovative things that are happening not on the two coasts. Uh, Dubuque is an amazingly innovative small city, largely because of leadership uh, from a very interesting set of uh, mayor and, and city council people that have been in place now for a number of years. So Dubuque had made a decision that part of the brand of the city was it was going to be green, it was going to be about conservation, and part of that was they were going to run smart meters out to all the houses, both for water and energy. Well, the question is, how do you get citizens to actually change their behavior? Because it's not so simple as to just put the meters in place. There's a set of people that if they see the data, they will make a change because it frustrates them that there's water running at two in the morning, but a lot of people won't. There are people that if you give them a price signal will change their behavior, but a lot of people won't. And so the experiment with a volunteer set of households, about 150 households, uh, was to see what else could you do to get people to be engaged in this process, and could you see a result if they were more engaged? And the answer is yes to both questions. And so we tried a variety of things, right? We all know from our own families that you cannot predict what any single human is gonna do in any situation. But can you influence, on average, groups of population? And so what you see is the portal that the volunteer families got uh, saw. They got their usage by hour. They could compare it to last week, last month, right? Are they doing better? Or are they doing worse? Uh, it, it reflected, um, you know, trends and other things, but they also saw it compared to their neighbors or you know, the city as a whole, or as we went forward, we added sort of a gaming piece to it, which is that you could uh, pick up a team of your friends and family, and you could compete against other teams across the city, and you got points in the game if you reported a leak, reduced your usage. Now, truly, the points didn't mean anything. Right? The only real benefit that you saw was financially and in your usage curve. But adding the gaming piece did get a lot of people more engaged. It's more fun to do the right thing if somebody notices that you're doing it. Right? So, and what we saw was you could directly correlate those families that are more engaged with how much water they saved or how much money they saved. The difference was really quite dramatic, even inside a population where they had all volunteered to be part of this to begin with. You still saw a substantial change. So it does a couple of things. One is it starts to give the city data so that when they start rolling this out to the rest of the city, you know, citizens who aren't quite sure is there really something in this for me, they then had real value they could say, look, it's worth it, here's how this volunteer process worked. 
but also just for the city, it provided tremendous efficiency. These families reported leaks about eight times more often than the average household does, which is an enormous cost savings to the city. Oops, I thought I had one more, but I don't. So I'm gonna tell one more story, uh, and then I'll, I'll, we'll go to the next speaker. Because the other thing that, on this citizen engagement point, is really around how do cities, most of us, when we live in a city, we're not sure that anybody at City Hall actually knows who we are, except when we, when we pay our taxes. And we're not sure they actually hear us, right? Tradition is you're gonna make a big change and you say, come to this high school auditorium on a given day if you care about this topic. And only the people with real access to grind come. And the rest of us who sort of aren't happy about it, but oh, I can't be there, I'm gonna, you know, don't get heard. So one of the other things that we're doing is this question of how do you use technology to have a better dialogue between the city and its own citizens? And so one example of that is the city of Toulouse in France, where they had rolled out a new traffic um, program to try to reduce traffic, uh, to try to do a better job with road repair. It was quite a comprehensive project. And it, it had gone through the normal process of vetting it with the citizens and communicating the new thing. And then the city started looking at social media for two reasons. The first was to get a better sense of what were issues they should be addressing, specific to traffic and roads. And they were able to identify much more quickly where repairs really should get made, right? And so they were able to repair roads on the average of one day after a bunch of people started complaining, rather than 15 days. And I think we'll hear about more about that from some other speakers. But the other piece was they were able to see in the social media that the citizens did not understand this new traffic program. And so the city was able then to be much more responsive and get more communication out to the citizens, make the citizens feel happier about living in the city. So with that, I think we'll have a discussion later about where to from here, but some practical things we're already doing. Thank you, Catherine. We'll stay here for a minute. Okay. I wanted to ask you, it's right. <laughs> fascinating to hear uh, that your examples included not only this sprawling megalopolis of Rio with six million people, but also Dubuque mm -hmm. with 58,000 people. Is there a minimum size that a city needs to have to be generating enough data to do things that are uh, useful and uh, truly smart, you know, is there? That's a great question. I don't think, I don't know that I know the answer. Uh, but what I would say is this, um, all cities have more data than they realize they do. Mm -hmm. But the, but the data is often locked down one agency at a time. And so even very small cities, if they start sharing, can make better decisions, right? Every city has to plan repairs. And how many of us have watched the road in front of our houses be torn up four times in a year? Mm -hmm. Once for water, once for gas, once, right? So even, and, and at least in uh, cities in the Northeast, it costs $50,000 every time you send a crew out to tear up the road. Right. So even a small city could see real changes. Is Dubuque the smallest city that IBM public sector is working with? I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I'm just, I'm thinking. I, this, is, this is the Rolodex in my mind, which I suppose dates me. Um, <laughs> it's, it's towards the low end. It's towards the low end. But actually, we see these sort of mid-sized cities as actually being more ready to make change mm -hmm. than some of the big ones. Very interesting. 